Now for the buccal infiltration, uh, I inject it into the mucal buccal fold. Here I am presenting my case in front of my colleagues and my professors. My heart rate is over 9,000. My blood pressure enough to cause hypertensive crisis. I am ting bricks. But before I got here, it all started in my final year of university. See, in sixth year, we have to work on our clinical case, which is one patient that you completely recover to acceptable oral health and then present in a presentation to a board of lecturers who give you a grade. And thus, the search for the patient began. I went searching around town. Yes, we have to find our own patients in Bulgaria as students. And I couldn't find anyone. I was worried one day while I was just sitting at the university and a kind old lady came out to me and asked if I was a student. I said yes, and she explained that she had dental issues. So I thought, perfect, come in for a free checkup. And I gave her a checkup. I did the initial anamnesis and I came up with a treatment plan for her and continued with the treatment throughout the year. This was my clinical case patient. She really liked sweets and chocolates. So that's where my presentation comes into play. I woke up on the day of the presentation refreshed and ready to start. Had my outfit ready and got on my way. Hi right, guys, so today I am doing my clinical case presentation. I am scared shipless, like literally I'm dying. But we're gonna be fine. My friends are gonna come later, we're gonna get a video and we'll have a good time. Let's go. I got to the lecture hall and there were a few people presenting before me. I took this time to prepare further so I would be ready when my turn had arrived. I was getting a bit nervous watching everyone getting tested by lecturers on the panel and everyone was instructed not to even clap for people when they finish their presentation. Yes. And my turn to speak finally came. As I was walking up to the stage, my heart was racing so fast. I wanted to thank all my teachers for all the advice they've given me throughout this case as I thought they really did deserve it. Professors and doctors that are here today, and thank you for allowing me to present my case. Um, and special thank you uh, to Dr. Svetanov, my fellow teacher, who helped me throughout this case. Uh, my additional department is prosthetic dentistry with Dr. Tomova. So let's begin. My patient came in, and we took her passport data first. Her name. I got permission to share my patient's picture, but not her name online. So this part is censored. Is that she has caries, she has some fractured teeth, and she had an inability to tear food with her front teeth. So that was the main complaint that she felt like she couldn't eat with her front teeth. And we'll see why later on. And Amesis VT and Familia were very clear. She had no diseases, she had no allergies, uh, she didn't have hypertension, no cardiovascular diseases, no hepatitis, nothing else like this. So she was the perfect patient for any kind of treatment. All right, so the clinical tests that we did with the extraoral and then the intraoral examination. Extraorally, first of all, we check the patient asymmetry, we check the texture of the skin, we check the color of the skin, rubor, color, dollar, tumor, we make sure that everything is fine. I checked the lymph nodes, there was no inflammation, so she has no infection. Next thing we went intraorally, I checked the buccal mucosa, I checked the gingiva, I checked the lips, I checked the tongue, I checked the palate, and it was all very healthy. So we could proceed with the treatment. Before we do anything in oral surgery, we need to check the blood pressure and the heart rate. Blood pressure was 120 over 80 with a heart rate of 68, so she's a healthy patient and we can do whatever we need to. Now, when it comes to diagnosis, for oral surgery, my diagnosis was radixis gangrenosis in T31, 41, and 42. As you can see in the picture over here, there is a lot of gangrene going on. My prosthetic diagnosis, which obviously would be after the extraction, is adensia totalis in dentinum permanentum. She had no teeth in the upper or lower jaw. The treatment plan, we had the extraction of the T31, 41, and 42. And then once this was done, we would do the prosthetic treatment for the complete denture for the lower arch to replace the missing teeth gaps. Now, why do I say lower arch? Because she already had a denture, a complete denture in the upper arch. So we'll just create a lower denture and include it with her current present denture. 
Alternative treatment I could give her is implant-supported fixed or removable prosthesis. In this case, she didn't have the money for that, so we decided to stick with the denture. Now, let's talk about what we did in our treatment. As you can see, the gynecologist roots were over there, and we needed to remove them. So in oral surgery, we began with the buccal and the terminal, uh, the lingual terminal infiltration. Now, for the buccal infiltration, uh, I injected into the mucobuccal fold, going down until we reach bone, withdraw slightly, aspirate, and then inject slowly. Lingual, I injected into the apex of the tooth slowly, and then we waited for a few minutes until the patient had no pain. So we could begin the next step of the extraction. Just before that, I had to wash my hands properly to get ready for surgery. The nurse in the room helped me put my surgical gloves on, and it was go time. Syndesmotomia, luxation, and traction. Syndesmotomia, I used a full set in order to make sure the periodontal fibers were all separated and the tooth became a little bit looser. Then I could use my straight hand elevator uh, with the concave part facing towards the tooth using a fulcrum to make the tooth loose. And then I used a mandibular anterior forcep to remove the tooth in the end. Once all the teeth was removed, it's very good, but we still had granulation tissue left behind. So for this, I used a curette, curettoid into the alveolar socket and the granulation tissue was all removed. We did have some extra gingival tissues, as you can see over here, we can't leave them obviously. So for this situation, we used some surgical scissors to remove all of the excess and then apply pressure with the gauze and the bleeding stopped. Now there was no need to uh, have sutures in this situation as the bleeding has stopped and it would just cause further damage to the gums. There was no need. So we waited for a few weeks and as you can see, a very good healing in the patient and we were ready for the next step to start making the dentures. For the dentures, we took the primary impressions using algae did a gypsum plaster class then created a custom uh, tray from Shara base plate and then we took the final impression uh, with silicone. All right, so I built the wax ring and uh, tested the out, them out inside the patient's mouth and then we calculated the video using the bicapillary line, the tragus line and the freeway space. Once it was in proper occlusion, we got it into the model and placed it in an occludator. When it was in the occludator, I managed to place all of the teeth in correct occlusion, correct position and then we could do the trying phase within the patient's mouth. In the trying phase, we check for different things such as denture retention, denture stability, and making sure that all of the phalanges were at the correct level. Once I was done, the patient was happy. I was able to cast and invest the denture. You can see very beautiful pull over here. And we tried it in the patient's mouth. Once again, the patient was happy, big smiles all around, and the treatment was completed. But not completely yet. We had to call her in about two weeks later to see if there were any issues and the patient did say that she had pain on the left side of her lower denture and we realized that the retromolar pad area had been extended a little bit too much. I trimmed that down and then since then I've been in, in touch with the patient. She's had no more problems and the treatment is completed. Thank you so much for your time. Once the presentation was done, it was now time for Q&As and some of the lecturers had some pretty difficult questions to ask me. Uh, so we followed the shape that was already used in the upper denture and we really? the same one for the lower one, yeah. Okay. Can you, can you read the pictures with Yeah. Yes? Oh. Okay. Ah. It depends on the lighting, I guess. Because yeah. well, well, it, in some of the pictures, they look totally different. Yeah. Uh, much, much brighter. Yeah, uh, it's the camera. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. So how much then uh, did you wait after the uh, tooth removal to initiate the fabrication of the lower denture? Uh, we waited around, I think it was eight weeks before we began, which is why she had some really good healing going on. Mm -hmm. So, eight, eight weeks. Okay, uh, uh, what was the, is, when you're doing uh, full dentures, one of the most important things is to assess the mobility of uh, soft tissues. Yeah. Was the soft tissues mobile, especially in the frontal area? Uh, no. No? They were quite sturdy. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Right. Other questions? Uh, if you imagine this lady is your very close relative, yeah. you will have many relatives one day, and you need to give them the best possible treatment. Yeah. What would be the best? treatment for this patient yeah so personally i would say first of all we would check the alveolar ridge and uh, if there is enough in that situation 
Okay, how you will check it? Uh, we can do this via x-rays. So we could do a panoramic and then do a CBCT or do some bite wings as well and check all of the bridges and then after that we give her an implant supported uh, bench or a bridge. If no bridge bone? Because, if no bone? Um, if there is no bone then the only option would be to give her a dent. The only option? In my knowledge. No, no. I'm sure as a professor there might be more. Good answer. <laughs> Next, please. Thank you so much.